Covenant. We're going to be looking at uh, Hebrews 2, 5 to 18. So over the, the past eight weeks, we've seen how Genesis 1 to 5 speaks to our past. It speaks to how God created all things. It gives us a framework for understanding human identity. We are made in the image of God to be in relationship with him, with one another, and with all creation. But we've also seen how it went wrong. The introduction of sin, the corruption of the human heart, which originates with Adam and Eve, but for which we all bear personal responsibility. And because it shows us how things have gone wrong, of course, they also speak to our present. It shows us why things are the way they are, why creation is broken, why human beings obscure God's image behind our own evil and fail to see and value that image in one another, why our relationships with God, with one another and creation are broken. But it also shows us that in the present we can have hope. The hope of restored relationship with God in the midst of the brokenness. Through the offspring of Eve. Through the second Adam, Jesus. And Genesis 1-5 to has also spoken to us of the future. The fulfilment of all that hope. The day when evil will be destroyed forever, when the perfect peace and provision of the garden will be the everlasting experience of all who walk with God in the new creation. Where sin and pain and death can never touch us, where we will see God's image perfectly restored in us, when we will be as God always intended us to be. So Genesis is a prophetic book. It's not just history, it is prophecy. Actually like the whole of the Old Testament, pointing forward to Jesus. And in him we experience the fulfilment of that prophecy in part with Jesus' first coming. His death and resurrection and ascension, the sending of the Spirit and all that means for life. But the complete fulfilment... While already accomplished, absolutely certain, it is not yet seen. And so we live in what we describe as the now, but not yet. It is all done, complete, but we don't yet live in the fullness of it. And Hebrews seeks to encourage us in that place. It draws together past, present and future in Jesus And we see that here in this chapter because verses 5 to 8 start by taking us back to our created purpose as human beings. A purpose which is unique to humans. Even angels don't enjoy this. We are the stewards of creation. Given the task of ruling what God has made as his representatives. We saw that way back in Genesis 1.28. We were created to fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over every living thing. A rule of care in God's stead. And that is the context of Psalm 8. Which the writer to the Hebrews quotes here. You have crowned him, man, mankind, with glory and honour, putting everything in subjection under their feet. This is, in one sense, who we are, people made in God's image with this purpose, but it's perhaps even more to say this is who we should be. Because the reality is a long way from God's intention, as we know. The writer tells us that in putting everything in subjection to mankind, he left nothing outside their control. Humanity was supposed to be the head of creation, 
Not above God, not equal with God, but ruling on God's behalf, under God. Given his authority and given the ability to rule. And yet the world around us is not under our control. Not by any means. Whether we're talking about a big global level or a personal one, our personal lives, we have to agree with the writer to the Hebrews. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, to mankind. Just look at the world around us. Natural disasters are happening all the time. Regardless of the development of science, we struggle to predict when they're going to happen. And we struggle to recover from them when they do. We're not even close to stopping them from happening. We just can't do it. It's not under our control. We can't control the weather, regardless of whether it's disastrous or just not very good. We can't control it. And that means then that we can't control our ability to grow the things that we want or need. Again, agricultural science has come on a long way. But it's not perfect. We cannot control these things. We can't even not grow the weeds that we want to avoid. (laughs) Even the things that we make and build as human beings... Are not entirely under our control. Look at what's happened in Miami over the last few days. Enormous apartment block which has collapsed. Built by people. By engineers. Very clever people who have done what they did to build this. And yet we don't have control entirely over what happens. Now some disasters and crises can be directly connected to our sin. Whether it's global greed that consumes resources without a little thought of the long term consequences, or the local greed that cuts corners and builds things that are inherently unsafe. But other disasters and crises, they're not directly connected to our sin. Some of them stem from our ignorance. Just not understanding fully what we are doing until the mistakes have been made. But then of course other disasters and crises just seem to be random. They just happen. Of course it all originates at the fall. It is all a constant reminder that things are not as they should be. That all things are not subject to us. And that ultimately the responsibility collectively lies with us. As human beings living in rebellion against God. So this shows us our need. There is a gap between the way that things are, both in human life and by extension in all creation, a gap between the way that things are and the way that things are meant to be. But of course the rest of the chapter tells us how someone came To bridge that gap between how things are and how things are meant to be. One came who is both man and God. Verse 9 says, At present we do not yet see everything in subjection to mankind. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus. We see Jesus who became flesh and the hope of the restoration of humanity's place and purpose is found in him. He is crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. He is given that place of honour which humanity should have occupied. Through the work that he has done. He was made perfect through suffering. That is made perfectly fit for his purpose as our representative. Because we could never gain hope for ourselves. 
We could never bring ourselves back to God and bridge that gap between the way that things are and the way that things should be. We could never do that because of our sin and yet at the same time neither could the perfectly just judge ignore that sin and act as if it never happened. We needed someone to be our representative. Someone who was sinless and so could come before God on our behalf. Someone who could be both a high priest and a perfect sacrifice. We needed him to taste death. For us to carry the burden and punishment of our sin. Verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Last week we were thinking about Genesis 5 and that repeated refrain in the chapter, and he died. That chapter gives us the line of Seth, the line from which Jesus would eventually come. It was the line of promise and hope. And yet, each one of them in that chapter, apart from one who we'll come to in a moment, each one was subject to death. And that means that each one, in a sense, was a lifelong slave to fear as well as to sin. But Genesis 5 also pointed to our hope. We saw Enoch, who walked with God and so was taken by God to be with him without having to face the curse of death. Enoch is an everlasting promise that the power of death can be defeated, not cheated. Not avoid it, but defeat it. Of course, Enoch couldn't do that. He couldn't defeat death. His descendants still die. But Jesus, through his death, defeated death for all God's people, for his brothers and sisters. In that sense, Jesus died our death. So that we would not have to. Yes we endure suffering in this world. This broken world. And unless Jesus returns first. We will face death. But it will be as we saw last week. It will be like falling asleep. We will go to be with him in spirit. And then in our resurrection bodies. When Jesus returns. Death is not death. To those who are in Christ. So Jesus died our death and having done so, Hebrews tells us that he was crowned with glory and honour. But here's a wonderful thing. His death is our death, but his glory is also our glory. He is the founder of our salvation or the author or pioneer of our salvation. He leads us through suffering and death into glory. Of course we won't have the same level of glory as God. Nothing can compare to God. But we will be brought to glory. That glory, it's not yet seen in us. Though there are reflections of it. But the work is guaranteed because of his obedience. So his death is our death. His glory is our glory. And also his holiness is our holiness. Jesus is perfect, sinless in thought, word and deed. He is, as we read at the beginning of the service, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Even in human flesh, he remained perfect and so could reveal God to us. He shows us both God and true humanity. He represents God to us so that he can represent us to God. And the Holy One is also the one who makes us holy. We read, he who sanctifies, this is in uh, in verse 11, 
He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. We are made brothers and sisters of Jesus, brought to represent God to the world as his image is restored in us, as his holiness is seen in us. I often think the most challenging command in all of scripture is be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. How can we ever do such a thing? And yet this is what we are told Jesus is doing in us. He is making us holy, making us perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. Again, it is not a finished work. It will not be finished until we see him face to face. And we are only too aware of our continuing sinfulness and weakness. But there's an astonishing promise in verse 11. He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. We're often ashamed of ourselves. And actually, if we truly understood how awful sin was and and how much it grieves God, it would consume us if it was not for this promise. He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. If we are in Christ, he is not ashamed. As Romans 8.1 puts it, there is therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. And so knowing this. Knowing that he is our brother and friend as we've just sung. Knowing that he is not ashamed of his children. His brothers and sisters rather. We can trust that the one who came as our representative to save us. Is also the one who will continue to help us. Until that work is complete. You see a representative could be very distant. Often it feels like that's how politics works. I I was thinking about this week and thinking I wonder if if this is more the case. As we see more um, career politicians these days. People who are distant from their constituencies. And then I remembered the story of Winston Churchill as the MP of Dundee. Who I think visited the city once. In his whole time. So it's nothing new. We have representatives in all sorts of areas. Who are distant from us. We elect them and their work is all done at a distance. Of course some maintain good connections with their constituents. But it's often how it feels isn't it. They may be representing us. But we don't really know them. We don't really see them. We don't have any connection or relationship with them. But of course our divine representative is not like that. He is interceding for us at the Father's right hand. Having presented us to the Father clothed in his righteousness. But he is also with us. In us by his spirit. A constant and present help. Look at verse 16. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Now that's significant that it refers to the offspring of Abraham, not the offspring of Adam. We've spoken over the last couple of weeks about common grace, about God's goodness to all people, regardless of their standing before him. But the very specific help of Jesus that this is talking about is not to all people, to the children of Adam. It is to his own people, to the children of Abraham, to those who, as Romans 4 puts it, are Abraham's offspring by faith. The help that is described here is for the church, for believers. And that help is seen in at least three ways in this passage. But they all have the same goal. The same purpose. Restoring the image of God in us. Bringing us to the glory and honour that God intended humanity to have. 
And the first area of help is something that we've just mentioned. It's holiness. He is the one who sanctifies, who, who sets apart, makes holy. And we are those who are sanctified. Set apart for God with lives which reflect his perfection. As we've said, it is a work that is not yet finished. And though we've been presented to God as holy through Jesus and are acceptable to him, we don't see that fully in our lives. But he helps us as we seek his grace to be more holy. To jump forward to Hebrews 4, verse 16 says that in Jesus we come with confidence to God's throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Part of that is the grace that we need to grow in that holiness. But we also see that it's the help he gives us to withstand temptation. Chapter 2 verse 17 says that he was made like his brothers and sisters in every respect. And verse 18 goes on to say that this includes being tempted. But it says that he was tempted to such an extent that it can be described as suffering. Because he himself suffered when tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Think about the temptation that Jesus experienced. The, 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 the most sort of obvious thing that comes to mind is at the beginning of his ministry. He was baptized and the spirit led him into the desert. And Satan came to him and tempted him, seeking to exploit his hunger, but really seeking to divert him from the task that lay before him. His temptations were saying, why bother laying aside your glory in obedience to God? Why not use what you have to get to that glory by a shortcut, effectively. Trying to give him an easy way out, a shortcut. He suffered in that temptation. He was hungry. He was weary. Of course, that wasn't the only time he was tempted. He was tempted when Peter rebuked him and told him that he shouldn't talk about his suffering. He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. In Peter's words, he heard the devil's voice again trying to turn him away from his God-given purpose. And of course, he was tempted with astonishing suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. I think it's... I, I have mixed feelings about the, um, the Mel Gibson film, The Passion of the Christ. But one of the things I found so powerful in that was the depiction of of the serpent in the garden of Gethsemane. And that temptation to turn away from God's way. And we see that in his words. He's there in mental and spiritual agony. Even after an angel comes to strengthen him. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. His agony was so severe that even an angel's help was not enough to relieve it. And what was his prayer? Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. He was wrestling with the temptation to take another direction, to take another way. But of course, as Hebrews 4 tells us, he was in every respect tempted as we are, yet Without sin, and so he also prayed, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Who of us has ever been so tempted and managed to resist that temptation to the point that we've experienced the agony that Jesus experienced in the garden? Resisting temptation is hard, it can be painful spiritually and mentally but the thing is that we can resist we have that wonderful promise that God always gives us a way out of temptation the way out is not our own strength of will 
The way out is the help that Jesus, who endured temptation and resisted temptation, remained perfectly obedient. It is the help that he gives us, largely coming through his word, but it is the help that he gives us that enables us to resist temptation. When we think that it is too much to bear, it may be too much for us to bear, but it's never, never too much. For him, we turn to him and find help. We also thirdly see that Jesus is our help actually in all kinds of suffering. It's not stated quite so plainly in this passage, but I I see it here because of how much it speaks of the suffering of Jesus. Not just when it relates to temptation. Three times our passage speaks of Jesus' suffering. Another time it doesn't use that word, but it speaks of his death. Chapter 4 verse 15 says that he is able to sympathise with our weaknesses. Referring primarily to temptation, but to every weakness of us who are flesh and blood. He shared our flesh and blood and he shared all the sorrows of human life. Even to the point of death. And so we can turn to him. And find help. In any suffering. In whatever suffering we experience. So this chapter. It opens up to us what God has done. To restore humanity to our God given place. And honour. It shows us what Jesus has done to bridge that gap between the way that things are and the way that things should be. As our representative, he has died our death. Died the death that we deserve. He has been crowned with glory which we will share. And he has revealed to us the holiness of life. That will be ours in him. Our future is secure. And in the present as we wait for his return. We are assured of his perfect help. He will bring us safely to that future. That he has won for us. Through his death and resurrection. In a little while we're going to be sharing in communion an opportunity for us with thankful hearts to reflect to remember to share together in what Jesus has done our representative our help our saviour and king first let's pray and then we're going to sing before the throne of God above let's pray Father God, we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the work that he has already done that is complete and certain. That work that brings us to you so that we do not have to fear death. So that we will be brought to glory. So that when we see him, we will be like him. Purified, holy. Lord, what an amazing hope we have in him. And we thank you, Lord, that in those times when we struggle to believe the word, when we struggle to trust all of this because we are suffering, whether it is under temptation or in any way, we thank you that we can look to you and find help. As the hymn says, our ever-present help in trouble. Lord, we thank you that Jesus' work is sufficient for our future, has dealt with our past, but continues by the Spirit in us in the present until you bring us to glory. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.